strange visions the past night brought me, which I will tell to the air, if there is really any help in that. Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling Raconteur, and this is Iphigenia Among the Tarians by Euripides, a strange and interesting play by Euripides, one that I personally hesitate to label a tragedy. I find very little in it that is emblematic of tragedy, Greek tragedy, even the ways Euripides likes to tinker around with the forms of tragedy. It doesn't feel tragic, and I'll explain why later in the video. Uh, rather, I find that there are elements of the play that seem to anticipate Greek middle comedy, the post-Aristophanes comedies, and even then, the later Roman comedies that often translated and adapted those Greek plays. Uh, moving forward a thousand years, the uh, types of plays that Ben Jonson, William Shakespeare, Moliere were all interested in, in creating. Uh, there we have irony, and Euripides is a master of irony. He's very subversive. Uh, but here we have comedic irony. We have those those dramatic ironies where the audience has a sense of what the characters don't know, and we have mistaken identity. We have a plot in which characters have to be clever and wily to figure out a way out of whatever tragic you know circumstance fate seems to have decreed for a family that is already wrecked by tragedy. So we have all of those elements. It, it, it becomes a very interesting play, uh, despite not feeling like a tragedy. So I'm going to include a link to the full text, which I highly encourage anybody uh, who's not familiar with the play to read, because I'm going to be diving into the plot, uh, some themes, of course, that I find in there, and the historical context, because the more I read Euripides, the more I find that his plays feel very informed by what's happening in Athens, what's happening in the Peloponnesian War at that time. So read it if you haven't, and here we go. Iphigenia among the Tarians uh, takes place after the Trojan War, and it takes place after uh, sort of that first sequence of famous events uh, occur after the Trojan War. So after the Trojan War, the Greeks go home, and Agamemnon, who commanded the Greek army, is murdered by his wife Clytemnestra. In turn, their son Orestes murders his mother Clytemnestra. The Furies drive him mad. Uh, Aeschylus has the beautiful Oresteia in which these occur in the Agamemnon, the Libation Bears, and finally in the Eumenides, the Furies no longer haunt Orestes for killing his mother uh, because it was deemed that he was avenging his father and that made it okay. And so everything is nice and tidy. Well, Euripides is going to play with that a little bit because Orestes still seems to be haunted a little bit in this play. Uh, and we have Iphigenia, whose alleged murder precipitated Clytemnestra killing Agamemnon uh, because Agamemnon had murdered their daughter Iphigenia, sacrificing her to allow the Greek fleet to sail to Troy. And so an event that occurred at the very start of the Trojan War is now creating this sequence of, you know, revenge murders after the Trojan War. And Iphigenia shares at the very beginning of the play in one of Euripides' great opening monologue poems, although I suppose this would be a soliloquy poem, uh, <laughs> that what really happened, that when Agamemnon was about to sacrifice her, a whirlwind took her up and Artemis saved Iphigenia, replacing her with a hind that was sacrificed there. And that in the intervening years, across the Trojan War, across the various journeys, Iphigenia has been serving as a priestess to Artemis uh, among the Tarians. So we find all this out, and we then have that passage where Iphigenia shares these these vision she had the previous night, and it's really quite terrifying and monstrous. I'll read it later on. Uh, and she thinks it means that her brother Orestes has finally died. Um, she doesn't really, she doesn't have news of him, she doesn't have news really of her family, uh, and she thinks that that was the end of her family's house, the end of the line is was Orestes, and so it's all over. She's the last. Well, as soon as she says that and leaves the stage, Orestes shows up with his friend Py Pylades. And uh, they've been shipwrecked here. And they've been shipwrecked in a really great place to be shipwrecked where the Tarians kill the Greeks who are shipwrecked there. <laughs> and if they're noble, they take them up and have them sacrificed. Nice little parallel to what, you know, had happened or was supposed to happen to Iphigenia before the Trojan War. Well, Iphigenia and Orestes, they don't recognize each other. It's been a long, long time. He was just a little baby when she was supposed to be sacrificed. So they don't recognize each other and she, he, she tries to quiz him about who he is he doesn't he's reticent he doesn't want to talk about this he's just here to oh I'll, I'll somebody's finally going to kill me okay all of the, these miseries will finally end is sort of his attitude but gradually throughout the questions and answers and she finally persuades Pylades is going to take her message 
to you know to uh, her own old hometown and she'll finally you know communicate with Orestes find out what happened to him the identities are revealed <laughs> but then the tragedy seems to occur because Iphigenia is supposed to have them sacrificed and Orestes is trying to figure out well how could we get out of this she's trying to figure out a way and as usual with Euripides it is the female character who is more intelligent who's more resourceful who's clever wise noble brave has all those great attributes and she devises a way for them to escape and so they do <laughs> and they manage to escape we have a deus ex, uh, ex machina moment where athena comes down as the god in the machine actually like as a character to sort of give this wonderful pronouncement and it's interesting because we get to the end of this tragedy and we realize as readers nobody's died there's not a single death in Iphigenia among the Tarians. Despite all of the discussion around, uh, you know, sacrifice and, you know, Orestes having to be sacrificed as Iphigenia was supposed to be sacrificed a generation earlier, uh, despite the, the chase when they escape from the, the Tarians, there's no body count. Nobody dies in this tragedy. Again, I don't think it's a tragedy. Uh, so I, I do want to give some readings from the play to explore some of those themes, some of those ideas. And then talk about how I think it connects to the historical context. So from that terrifying early scene, strange visions the past night brought me, which I will tell to the air if there is really any help in that. As I slept, methought I had escaped this land and was once more in Argos, sleeping in the midst of my maidens, when lo, the surface of the ground was shaken by an earthquake, whereat I fled, and standing outside the house, I saw its coping falling, the whole building dashed in ruin from roof to base. Only one column, methought, of my father's halls was left standing, and from its capital it let stream the auburn hair, and took a human tongue. And I, observant of the murderous craft I practice against strangers, began sprinkling it, as if it had been a victim, weeping the while. Now this is the interpretation of the dream. Orestes is dead. T'was for him I began the rites. <laughs> That is a terrifying vision that we get at the beginning of the play. And it really does seem uh, to, to be this, this play that is just wild. Later on, we have a herdsman who tells Iphigenia uh, and the chorus about these new strangers who were shipwrecked, who by tradition will now be executed. But another, with a reckless disregard of what is right, scoffed at his prayers and would have it that they were shipwrecked mariners sheltering in the gully for fear of our custom, having heard how we sacrifice strangers in this land. Now most of us, thinking he was right, determined to hunt them for the goddess, victims such as our country offers. Meantime, one of the two strangers, leaving the rocky cave, suddenly stood still and fell to shaking his head wildly up and down and groaning loudly, trembling to his very fingertips in a frenzied fit and shouting like a hunter, there, Pylades, dost see her, there, dost see her now, the hellish snake, how eager she is for my blood, with her fearsome vipers all agape to bite me. And yet a third who belches fire and death wings her way to a rocky height with my mother in her arms to hurl her thence upon me. Oh, horror, she will kill me. Where am I to fly? <laughs> what? <laughs> we could not see these weird shapes, but he mistook the lowing of cows and the barking of dogs for the sounds which he said the fiends were uttering in imitation of them. Now we were sitting huddled together in silence as doomed men, when lo, he drew his sword and rushing like a lion into the midst of the heifers, fell to slashing at their flanks. <laughs> what? So this is our introduction to Orestes. What a pleasant, pleasant person. And it's very clear that uh, Euripides is not buying the traditional ending of the Eumenides, that your Orestes is still haunted by murdering Clytemnestra. Uh, but we, we have, amid all of these long, strange poems that are filled with terrifying imagery, we have a really interesting component uh, to, to these tragedies in which we get Euripides giving two characters and sort of the shellcock dialogue that is, of course, a hallmark of many of the great later comedies, where it, it's it's not quite banter. There's there's an element of dread to it. There's There's, you know, high stakes, but it's quick, it's fast. And so uh, uh, many of these occur between Iphigenia and then Thoas, who's uh, a leader there 
in among the Tarians. And uh, so we get these moments. Yes, and only now they dangled before me a tempting bait to catch my fancy by bringing news of those in Argos to lure thee? Good news of Orestes, my only brother, no doubt to induce thee to spare them for their glad tidings. They said too that my father was alive and well. Naturally thy escape was a reference to the claims of the goddess. Yes, for I hate all Hellas that betrayed me. What, pray, are we to do with the strangers? We must piously observe the established custom. Is not the lustral water ready in thy knife? My purpose is to cleanse them first by purification. And so Iphigenia now is putting on this front because she's convincing Thoas that the way to get Orestes and Pylades properly sacrificed is that they need to be purified because, whoa, all that stuff Orestes was raving about out on the beach, it's because he's just like got the worst type of blood guilt you could possibly have, Thoas. We don't want to take him into the temple. That's going to ruin everything. <laughs> And so Iphigenia has contrived the escape plan. And Euripides has kind of shared this, and we now then get it. But there's a beautiful moment in that escape plan, which is that Iphigenia shares this in front of that chorus of attendants of captive women from Greece. And she basically says, look, I have to trust you. Our fate, our collective fate is in your hands. You know what we're going to do. And if you say anything about it, we will all die. And I think what's special about that is Euripides, by having it be this chorus of Greek women, um, kind of brings the audience into the play. That the audience of Greeks is represented by the chorus. That they are uh, complicit in the community that Iphigenia is giving to the chorus and allowing them in on her secret. That the audience is in on the secret as well. And I, I think it's just this wonderful moment uh, that, that feels a little bit meta from Euripides. <laughs> Uh, but after we have that, we then get this great, <laughs> great moment where Athena shows up because despite having escaped, despite having, you know, everybody close their eyes, like we can't see them because if you see them, they're gonna, <laughs> you're going to be stained by the blood guilt they have. And I've got to take them down. We've got to take, you know, this special statue down with them as well. I've got to purify that. And of course, they all get on a boat and take off. And Poseidon is angry, so he wraps up the waves, and Thoa sends the Tarians after them. He's not going to allow them to escape. And then Athena shows up. Whither, King Thoas, whither art thou carrying this pursuit? Hearken to the words of Athena who is here. Cease pursuing or sending soldiers streaming after them. For Orestes was destined by Apollo's oracle to come hither, first to escape the fury of the Avenging Fiends, and then to convey his sister home to Argos, and the sacred image to my land, a respite from his pre present afflictions. This I say to thee, and so it goes on, Orestes, thou hearest the voice, for it is a goddess speaking, although thou art not here. He's off stage. Mark well, my Hess, take the image of thy sister and go hence. And it goes on. As for thee, Iphigenia, thou must keep her temple keys at Brown's hollowed path of steps. There shalt thou die, and there shall they bury thee. To Thoas, and I charge thee, send these daughters of Hellas on their way hence because of their righteous decision. I saved thee once before Orestes when I allotted the votes equally on the hill of Ares, and this shall be an ordinance. Whoever secures an equal division of votes wins his case. So bear thy sister from the land, son of Agamemnon, and thou, Thoas, be no longer angry. And Thoas, of course, <laughs> whoso hears the voice of God and disobeys is no sane man, O Queen Athena. Uh, and Athena ends with. Well said, for necessity is stronger than the eye and than the gods. And so the chorus ends, Most holy victory, possess my life and never grudge thy crown. So we have a happy ending. We have a tragedy in which no one has really died. Uh, everybody escaped. Athena has ordained that Orestes will no longer be haunted by the Furies. Happiness should be here. Uh, so again, it just it feels so much closer to comedies than to tragedies. The, the moments where the identities are uncovered, that the plot is suddenly revealed, and yet maybe they still can escape and make it, all of those just feel like hallmarks of comedy. And so it's interesting to find Euripides uh, trying this out. And I think there's a historical reason for, for why he does this. I think he tries this out because this play was written around the time of the Sicilian expedition in the Peloponnesian War, which was a disaster. It was this massive strategic disaster for Athens and really kind of put Athens in a place where they were no longer sort of 
winning the Peloponnesian War or winning the peace, but were going, it was going to be a struggle to just come out as well as they were at the start of the war. And so I think Euripides, with this play, with uh, the play Helen, that was uh, written right around possibly the same year, right around the same time, he wanted to give the audience something that was a little more hopeful. Uh, the tragedies of Medea or Hippolytus uh, or of Hecuba that are very dark, very intense, very brutal plays. Those were not plays that the audience needed to hear in the aftermath of, of the horrifying defeat um, at Syracuse. But the play is also filled with some of his poetry. And it's interesting that allegedly some of the survivors of the Greek army that was that were captured there um, during the Sicilian expedition would be spared if they could recite lines from Euripides' plays. Uh, and they could recite like the long poems because uh, the those poems were so popular. So people who knew and had memorized them would be spared and not uh, be executed or, or uh, sent to do like the really horrible manual labor of slavery. So I, th I personally find that this play probably is less tragic because life was so tragic at that time. But it's a really interesting play from Euripides. Uh, it doesn't quite capture the same nuance that I find in Alcestis, uh, which I think is probably my favorite play from Euripides, and again, not particularly a tragedy, but it's a very interesting play again. As I said, it has deep intertextuality with the Oresteia uh, by Aeschylus. Um, if one is curious about reading more about the Peloponnesian War, you don't always just have to read the cities. You could grab a copy of the Viking Portable Greek Historians, which anthologizes selections from Thucydides, Herodotus, uh, Polybius, and Xenophon. And in, within the Thucydides selection is, of course, the chapters on the Sicilian expedition. I mentioned the Roman comedians. Um, Terence is one of the really fun masters there. Um, I had mentioned as well Shakespeare. I think we, we see elements of what Shakespeare's doing in uh, something like Twelfth Night with the Mistaken Identities, the sort of Shuttlecock dialogue. But also I find that um, the late romances from Shakespeare, I'm thinking Cymbeline, Winter's Tale, um, The Tempest, all of those have the Shakespearean interiority. Uh, they are more complex. They're far more developed. But the, the sort of basic philosophies that exist within them feel very similar to what we find in Iphigenia among the Tarians. I had mentioned as well... Uh, Moliere <laughs> as someone who likes to play with the, those elements as well. So this was an interesting play to read. Uh, I really enjoyed kind of approaching it uh, and reading it in, in conjunction with Iphigenia and all this because of how different the plays feel. So let me know your thoughts. Uh, let me know if you've read this play or if you have other favorite plays from Euripides. And again, I hope everybody's having a great week. Thanks.